Hello and welcome to Let the Stone Speak. I'm Brent Nuktagal, the host of the podcast. This is a program where we talk about the latest in biblical archaeology, brought to you sometimes from Jerusalem, sometimes from Israel, and sometimes from right here uh, in Edmond, Oklahoma, where I am. Behind me is a biblical archaeology exhibit. It's entitled The Kingdom of David and Solomon Discovered. And uh, it's been here for about three months, and it'll continue all the way through till January 2025. So if you haven't uh, seen this and you are in the area around Oklahoma, uh, please do come out and visit us. It's open from 10 to 6 on most days. I'm here uh, at about 9 a.m. in the morning um, before we open to do the podcast. Uh, but if you are interested in, in archaeology, and uh, specifically this period about David and Solomon, kind of this really important time uh, where archaeological debate has been raging for about 20 years. We've, this is a, an, an exhibit where we're bringing about 48 artifacts from Jerusalem, from other parts in ancient Israel, from the 10th century. So 3,000 years ago from 1000 BC all the way through to about 900. That's the 10th century. And um, these artifacts are incredibly rare. We've taken some from the Israel Museum, uh, some from excavations in Jerusalem uh, that weren't shown to the public yet. And so this is a, an exhibit you won't want to miss uh, if you are in the area. Today, though, we're going to be talking about a, uh, a study that was done over the past decade and has finally come to light in the PNAS Journal uh, about a radiocarbon study from Jerusalem, detailing uh, different samples that were taken from different sites within the ancient tell of Jerusalem. And this, this is, is bringing to life a number of different things from the biblical period, from this time of the 10th century uh, and a little bit later. We're going to review and go through a couple of these um, really interesting findings from this study. So this, this is not uh, boring in any way. Uh, when you might hear a carbon dating study, that sounds boring. It's not. It's exciting. It's um, showcasing some history of, of ancient Jerusalem that hasn't been really documented uh, extremely well before. Um, it's giving us another dating tool in which to help us uh, more correctly, correctly and accurately date ancient remains from this time period uh, of the biblical kings of Judah, which is going to help us uh, in archaeology. Archaeology is all about dating. And so the more precise your dating technique, the more precise you can say when something happened anciently, and then the more precise your, your uh, historical um, look back on, on the events in the Bible. You can have the biblical event for, for an event, a biblical dating for an event, and then the archaeological dating. Now, if the archaeological dating has a huge window, then how sure can you be of, of how it matches a certain biblical event? It's very hard to do that. Um, but the more precise the dating becomes, then the more precise uh, the window is, and then the more accurately we can put it alongside the Bible, something that biblical archaeology hopes to do. And um, yeah, so thoroughly interesting. Um, to begin this, I'm going to play a video that was produced by the City of David Foundation with, with the help of um, the Antiquities Authority and, and others. It's about a two minute video and it details some of the findings of the study and then kind of gives you a picture of, of where uh, in Jerusalem these, these carbon dates were sampled from. For over 150 years, we are excavating here in Jerusalem and we are arguing about the date of every layer. For the first time, we are harnessing together hard sciences archaeology and biblical historiography in order to reconstruct more accurately the history of the city in its most crucial times. Go actually to the field to get the samples. We search for the charred material or organic remains. We take the sediments under the microscope and then we need to identify botanically the remains. Then we turn it into graphite and do the measurement at the AMS. In the accelerator, the carbon is being accelerated to 3,000 kilometers per second, and that enables us to measure the level of C14 in very high accuracy. We also dated a 100 single tree rings. We know that each ring is growing in one year, 
For example, this specific single ring was growing at 586 BC, at the same year of the destruction of the first temple. The resolution of Sifratini was very, very bad. At 200, 300 years, it was impossible to distinguish anything else. With the work we have done in the city of Devi, we succeeded to reach a resolution less than 10 years which is really something very, very new and dramatic. If today we thought that the home of this is built by the king of Hizkiah and a part of the work of the king of the king of the king of Jerusalem, today we understand that the home was built like 100 years ago by the king of Hizkiah, after the destruction of the earth of the king of the king of Jerusalem at the beginning of his life. He wrote the theory from the king and the king of Hizkiah and the king of Jerusalem in Hizkiah. I'm holding in my hand a skull of a bat that was found here in the niche behind me. And this bat entered the niche somewhere around 760, 770 BCE, the days of King Uziah. And from this bat, we can reconstruct the time that Jerusalem expanded from the old core by the spring into the areas to the west. For us, the bat is like a time capsule. During the 10th century BCE, the days of David and Solomon, this research has shown that the city is occupied in different areas and seems to have been larger than we thought previously. We can pinpoint specific buildings and relate them to specific kings mentioned in the biblical text, such as Uzziah, Hezekiah, Menashe, and others. This research is really exciting. We managed to come together, a group of scholars from different institutions, and really publish something that will be quoted for generations to come. So that gives you a couple of the findings uh, from the study, and we're going to go through them in a bit greater detail and draw attention to perhaps some of the more significance of it, the significance of it that isn't detailed as much um, in the study itself. I will say, though, there is, there's, there's one element of this that's been reported in the public media. Uh, I've got an article here from Haaretz that describes the study and it just gives you an idea, this article of the bias that's against the Bible, that they will read into the study and, and even they're searching for things that disprove the Bible to say that, yes, the Bible is true in here, but over here it's false. And um, it's just completely inaccurate. And I just want to debunk something here that, that you might have um, seen relating to this, this period of King Hezekiah. You'll notice in that video they talked about how you know, this war was previously dated to Hezekiah's time, but now we're going to date it to King Uzziah's time. A different biblical king that was, you know, responsible for building in Jerusalem. So um, let's just go to this article. It's by Ariel David. It was published on April 29th, shortly after this carbon dating study was came out. Uh, I will say that we have our own article that goes through some of the points I'm going to give you. Ours is called A Revolutionary Carbon Dating Study of Ancient Jerusalem, and it goes through the points I'm going to cover in greater detail. So if you want to you know, read up about what I'm covering, go straight to this article. It's going to give you some of the background. And then I'll also have a link to the, the major study that was produced, um, the scientific study as well. And uh, we'll get to that as well in a second. But first, this, this article, Jerusalem in King David's time was much larger than previously thought researchers say. So, you know, interesting title. Every time you, the titles are always going to be interesting. Why? Because they want to get clicks and something revolving King David uh, is always going to get clicks. So just the first couple of paragraphs here. In the age-old debate about how much of the Bible is a true story, size matters. Was there really a grand united monarchy of the ancient Israelites under David and Solomon, as the Bible relates? Was Jerusalem truly built by Solomon into the magnificent capital of an empire, or was it a tiny backwater? So this debate, again, it's, most, it's, it's very important. It's what our exhibit is about. We also have our magazine um, that doubles kind of as our exhibit brochure. It's about uh, 100, 130 pages, something like that, and it goes through all the proof uh, that is in the public domain at this point um, for King David and Solomon's kingdom. And we combine the, the work of maybe about 10 scholars uh, in Israel and elsewhere and bring to you the very latest, like going back to you know, last year's discoveries, uh, even when we we're putting this together uh, earlier this year, or late last year, earlier this year, we had to revise articles and add articles to it right at the last minute because more evidence was being presented of the biblical, of archaeological evidence 
of this time period of the 10th century. So this, this is available to you for free, this magazine. Uh, the hard copy can be sent to you wherever you are in the world. Uh, simply go to armstronginstitute.org or write an email to letters at armstronginstitute.org and uh, request the magazine. We'll send it to you as fast as we can to get you a copy of this. So continuing from this article, uh, a first of its kind radiocarbon study of Jerusalem in the first temple period. So the first temple period just is referring to the period that it was in use. So this is Solomon's time all the way through to the destruction, the Babylonian period in the early 6th uh, century um, during the time of, of Jeremiah, King Zedekiah. Um, that's the first temple period. So a temple built by Solomon as opposed to the second temple period. Um, even though David didn't build the first temple, uh, David's included in the first temple period. So around 1,000 to 586. A first of its kind radiocarbon study of Jerusalem in the first temple period is now offering new, new insight into the city's history in biblical times. On the one hand, it brings tantalizing clues that the city was already an important urban center in, the, in David and Solomon's time, and not an insignificant village, as scholars more skeptical of the biblical historicity have long maintained. So this is great. On the one hand, it does do this. But wait for it. There's going to be on the other hand, <laughs> as there, there always is. But is the on the other hand actually true? We'll talk about that briefly. On the other hand, the new radiocarbon data uh, or data contradict the biblical text. That's a big claim on who exactly built what and when in Jerusalem during the first temple period. No, it doesn't. It does not contradict the biblical text in any way. Absolutely not. Zero contradiction. And yet this is how it has to be set up, right? There's got to be some controversy here. Um, and the controversy it talks about how it's um, correcting the biblical, contradict the biblical text it's talking about this, this point about how a wall on the eastern side of the city of David, um, this ancient core of Jerusalem, how a wall there that was previously dated to King Hezekiah's time, based on the biblical narrative, because the Bible talks about King Hezekiah building a wall in Jerusalem. King Hezekiah lived around 700, uh, or during 700, or perhaps a bit earlier, when he reigned over Jerusalem at a critical period. The Assyrians were invading and he had to build a wall. That's what the Bible says. And so scholars had previously dated a wall in the city of David to King Hezekiah's time. So that's what had happened previously. Now, this carbon dating study comes along and says, uh, no, that wall, that previous scholars, you know, separate from, this is, this, is, this is overturning previous scholarship. It's not overturning the Bible. It's overturning previous scholarship. The wall that they have dated to Hezekiah's time previously, the carbon dating study says it's now 100 years earlier, which dates to King Uzziah's time, which... Actually, the Bible talks about him building up Jerusalem also. So when he says here that, on the other hand, the new radiocarbon data contradict the biblical text on exactly who built what. No, it doesn't. It contradicts what previous scholars have said was built in Jerusalem and, and applied a biblical character to it. So that's what it overturns. It actually, this, this science always, in, 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 when it comes to archaeology like this, it's Biblical archaeologists love greater dating techniques because they, they narrow down the windows of construction so you can become more accurate in your historical uh, recreation of what happened, your representation of what happened anciently. And, and then you can match it up quite well with the biblical text. And that's what the study did. The study did not bring forth one bit of evidence that contradicts the biblical text. Zero. So this, this on the other hand, from Haaretz is a waste of time. It's infactual. It's, it, it's incorrect, 100%, to say that. And yet, that's what you get. Now, this is what you get from Haaretz. This is popular reporting on archaeology. And I will say Haaretz does a great job, actually, of bringing to light discoveries, of interviewing the, the archaeologists themselves. Um, and so without them, would there, be greater, would there be less exposure to what's been discovered? Yes. But watch out for the interpretation of the discoveries from the mind of the Haaretz reporter here, because it, it does not support what the scholars actually said in, return, in regards to overturning or contradicting the biblical text. The discoveries from this study, they contradict the 
uh, a, pri a prior uh, archaeological or an archaeologist assumption or, or uh, dating of a wall, and it actually supports another biblical creator of that wall. So this, this study is entitled Radiocarbon Chronology of Iron Age Jerusalem Reveals Calibration Offsets and Architectural Developments in Typical Fashion. This uh, scientific report is, uh, has got a boring title, which is fine because the study itself is anything but boring. So what they did is they took 103 different carbon samples uh, of the ancient core of Jerusalem. We're actually not on the ancient core of Jerusalem. Like, this is critical to understand. So Jerusalem's built on a ridge. It's known as the Eastern Hill. Uh, and this is the ancient core of Jerusalem starting in the south and then growing northwards up the hill, up the ridge, uh, from the city of David, which was the original town that David conquered, around a thousand, and then across to the area, geographic area known as the Ophel, uh, going northwards where the Palace of Solomon would be built, uh, the temple, and so on. And then there's a slight valley or a valley to the to the western side called the Tyropean Valley. Um, and then what? We, if you keep on going along that valley and up the other hill to the other side, it's called the Western Hill. And so Jerusalem is on these two hills. The eastern hill is slightly lower than the western, the west, well, lower than the western hill actually by about 100 meters. Uh, the top of the the the, uh, the top of the city of David is around 700 meters above sea level. The top of the uh, western hill is 800 meters above sea level. And so if you've been to Jerusalem, you can actually look down from what's known as Mount Zion today. Uh, misnomer, but anyway, you look down from that towards the eastern hill, towards the ancient core of Jerusalem, and you're looking down quite quite far. Now, the reason the eastern hill, even though it's lower, was chosen was because that is the that has the access point to the Gihon Spring, the perennial water source of Jerusalem. You want to be close to the spring. The spring wants to be included in your walls. Uh, so, so the ancient core is on the eastern hill. And then Jerusalem expanded to the west. And the question has been, when did this expansion take place? And this carbon dating study is trying to answer that question in part. So really, really quite interesting. Um, but these 103 samples that were taken, they were not taken on the top of the ridge. This is important to note. All the data is taken from the side of the ridge. Uh, lower down. So it's really, you could say it's from the ancient core, but not really. It's not from the most ancient core of Jerusalem. It's from just after the ancient core of Jerusalem, just off the hill. So in the very north, they took samples from the Gavati excavation. This is a long-running excavation uh, done right now with Tel Aviv University and the and, um, uh, the Israel Antiquities Authority, and then excavations along the, the eastern side of the eastern ridge as you go down towards the Gihon Spring itself, uh, where you have a city wall. And so this isn't a city wall, the earliest ancient core. It's already off the side of the ridge um, uh, on both sides. So the data that they're going to present is not taken from the top of the hill where David built. It's not taken from the top of the hill where Solomon built. It would be great if we had such a beautiful uh, strata uh, or layers one after the other where you could take samples and find pottery and so on. There have been carbon dates that are taken from the Ophel. Uh, they're not out yet, but not part of this study, but I'm sure they'll come out at some point that helps us date the top of the ridge. So what they're looking at is everything that's already after the time period of David and Solomon as the Bible would describe where they built they're on top of the ridge, and then we're finding that excavations in the valleys, starting to go into the valleys, are all, uh, they're presenting evidence of construction that's quite early. So all it can tell us then is that we have construction in the valleys at a certain time, as we'll get to, and then whatever's on top of the ridge had to be before that. And so this brings out really a really important finding. The second finding we'll cover. The first finding, though, relates to um, the, the fact that even though they're not, they didn't take the samples of these 103 samples, and most of them were, were short-lived uh, seeds. Over two-thirds of them were seeds. So this isn't the case of a big bit of wood, you know, that sits, that dies, and that's when the carbon dating clock starts, and then it goes on, and it's inside a building or whatever, or it lies down dead there for a while and 100 200 years later it's come in and incorporated into the building that wouldn't really give you a great date um, 
as far as a carbon date goes, um, because it was used for so long in a building. It won't really date the occupation. However, if you have like a date seed or a grape seed or something like that, or an olive pit, um, this gives you a date of the person that ate it, plucked it from a tree, and it is consumed that year, right? So the dating period that is, or the date that's attached to that is going to give you the date of the occupation. So they're far better, and over two thirds of the samples were, were dates. So this is a, a really good, you know, that's what you want to use in a carbon date, uh, for carbon dates, are these short-lived samples. Um, there were a few animal bones that were taken, uh, which is also good uh, as well, um, because, uh, well, one of them was a little piglet that was, that was going to be used in, uh, was in a room that I think the piglet was was uh, carbon dated. A bat was definitely carbon dated, found in a little nook. Bats don't live for that long, and so that can give you a great date as well. Um, nevertheless, the samples are good. And so the first key finding that this brought out is showed that even though they were taking the samples from off the core of the ridge, inside the building materials, whether it's plaster or a floor, what they found was um, that there were carbon samples that dated to the 12th century to the 10th century. 20% actually of these samples, uh, 18 of them, uh, dated to this period that belonged to King David's time or just earlier or, or King Solomon's time. And so it showed that there were people in Jerusalem uh, during the time of David and Solomon and that you're digging, you're finding these samples on two different sides of the hill in the construction of later later buildings and it, so it's showing that it, Jerusalem was well inhabited during the time of David. So this is why when, when Haaretz has its title, Jerusalem in King David's time was much larger than previously thought. Um, no, <laughs> it wasn't. I mean, previously thought by who? I suppose it's true, um, but by who? Uh, who's previously thinking that it was a smaller size and now larger? If you read the biblical text, it will give you the size basically from David and Solomon's time. So there's nothing new in that, um, but it is providing evidence of the biblical description of what Jerusalem would have been like during David and Solomon's time based on the fact that we have evidence of existence, of, of habitation, of Jerusalem, and you, would, you could say densely populated Jerusalem during the 10th century. I'll just quote the conclusion um, of this point in the actual study itself uh, of this point. It says this in the conclusion of the study, we provide concrete evidence for a widespread human presence in the city during the 12th to 10th centuries BC. So the 10th century is the time of David. As short-lived materials, material from all the areas studied was dated to those centuries. However, these contexts were often lacking diagnostic ceramics. This signifies that the radiocarbon dating on a broad scale should be used to provide a more reliable site history particularly in a densely rebuilt city where foundations often reach the bedrock. So they're kind of getting to the sec one of the second points here of this study. It showed that while you don't have ceramic or, or an assemblage of evidence of people living there using the ceramics, floors during this time of ceramics from the 10th century on them, you find in the construction materials of the buildings themselves that they have 10th century um, evidence of, of 10th century uh, either construction um, or that there was the 10th century represented in Jerusalem earlier. And so if you're going to recreate a history based on pottery, and this is what we do most of the time because pottery is the, is the chief dating tool. It, it show, it, the pottery styles change over time. And so if you can date a pottery style, you can date the layer. But the problem is oftentimes in Jerusalem or other sites that are inhabited for a long period of time, the pottery that you find in a site is going to represent the last period in which that building was in use. For example, if, you're, if your house is, is 300 years old that you live in right now, and unfortunately your house goes through a major destruction and burns down, and then they're, you know, the, the investigators are picking through the remnants of the house in this destruction, what stuff are they going to find? They're going to find the stuff that was on the floors that was in use during the final occupation of this building, you. So they're going to find the stuff of the present day, right? Mostly. It's only, but is that going to give them a date for the building, a date for construction of the building? No, it's not. That because all that stuff from the from the building period is is gone, right? You're going to have to go beneath the floor, and you might find 
some stuff that dated to the construction period. Maybe they put a footing wall in 300 years ago, uh, a foundational wall, and they were having a cup of tea. Uh, at the time, the workmen were, and while they were having a cup of tea, um, the cup broke, and they thought, well, you know, it's don't panic. It's, it's not going to destroy the world if I throw this out. Um, and so they, they threw it in the foundation trench for their footing wall. Uh, and so you have a little bit of um, material from the time of construction. And then they put the floor down, right, at that point. And then they start living in it 300 years ago. However, this floor is repeatedly clean time and time and time and time and time and again for 300 years. And so when an archaeologist, and then it's destroyed during your period. And so when the archaeologist or you know, the investigator today is going to investigate when this building was built, all they could say is it has a window of construction from the destruction period, which is now... Two, hopefully they can find something underneath the floor that would date it back to an earlier period, 300 years earlier. And so you're going to have a window of time of about 300 years from the stuff on top of the floor to the stuff beneath the floor. And then since the wealth of, of evidence of material culture relates to that final period, the archaeological date is going to be pushed up most likely to that final period of habitation. And they will say, well, you know, this is, this is when Jerusalem is inhabited richly because look at all the material culture of it or your house but really it's not the truthful date of the construction of the building the date of the construction of the building was 300 years before your time and yet that's not represented in the majority of the finds so this is known in archaeological terms as the old house effect so one of the key findings of this study is it's showing that the old house effect in Jerusalem is real. And this is something that we've argued for decades for in Jerusalem, that the Bible records that Jerusalem was never destroyed from the time period of David all the way through to the time period of the Babylonian destruction 400 years later. And so what is the wealth of material? What is the majority of the material that you're going to find in archaeological excavation dating from the first temple period in Jerusalem? It's going to date to Jeremiah's time. But that's not because David's time wasn't represented or isn't, wasn't there or Solomon's time wasn't there. It's just that they lived in the same home for hundreds of years. And so it's going to be always less represented in the archaeological, uh, uh, archaeological, with the archaeological data. It's just the way it's going to be. And so this is what they found as part of this study. And they refer specifically to Building 100. This is located in the Gavati Excavation, a famous building now that, that has yielded a wealth of discoveries. Um, if you recall you know, interviews that we've done in the past with Gavati archaeologists, um, we've talked about um, the seal impression of Nathan Malik that was found. Uh, he's a biblical figure from the time of Jeremiah. Uh, we've talked about how they had storage vessels there that were found crushed in the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem around 586. And they had evidence of vanilla-laced wine in them. Again, Jeremiah's time. Uh, they found a bunch of ivory uh, fragments there. A thousand, I think it is, that they put back together to recreate um, some inlays. Again, Jeremiah's time. See, everything dates from this building, the stuff, the material culture from Jeremiah's time. Why? Because that's when the building was destroyed. But then they can go into, and this is what they do in the study, and they find carbon dates from underneath the floor, in the floor, in the mortar. And what it revealed to them is that the building was built 300, have I got this right? Yeah, 300 years before Jeremiah. And yet there was one pretty major, or two, two, two major, um, renovations to it one after the earthquake of Uzziah's time this is in um, the the middle of the uh, seven, eighth century 750 760 in that time and then one other renovation during Manasseh's time around 680 I believe it is so even though the material culture doesn't relate to Uzziah's time doesn't relate to Ace's time as I kind of fight for in, in our article about when this building might have been built um, or or Manasseh's time everything relates to Jeremiah's time and yet their study from the carbon samples has shown that it was in use for 300 years. The old house effect, it takes place in Jerusalem, thanks to this carbon study. Just, I'm just going to quote them. Now, this is from the study itself. The lengthy period of use of Building 100, determined from our radiocarbon dates, may, may be emblematic of the city's long-term economic flourishing and relative political stability, a.k.a. hey, This kind of shows that Jerusalem was stable, it thrived economically for hundreds of years, from 900 onwards. 
There is no destruction layer apart from an earthquake um, uh, or destruction, not necessarily a full layer, uh, from the earthquake and the things were rebuilt. But no massive destruction of Jerusalem. That's what the Bible says. That's what the archaeological record says. Up until the Babylonian invasion at the beginning of the 6th century BC under Jeremiah's time, the city's continuous occupation indicates a time of democratic, demo, demographic growth while recurring conflicts with regional empires negatively affected settlements elsewhere in the region. Remarkably, while our radiocarbon determinations demonstrate a 300-year use of Building 100, the pottery found in association with the building belongs almost entirely to the end of the 7th and early 6th centuries BC in the Terminal Iron Age. So, again, fantastic. This is true science showing that the building was built 300 years earlier, and they even say, I mean, in the Paris press release, it came out that, you know, the archaeologists there believe this was a, this was a building maybe during jo Jehoash's time, um, and he is uh, middle of the ninth century, and yet the study itself, if you actually read the study about the dating of this earliest phase of the building, I think it ha I have it here, the earliest phase of the building... Uh, actually dates a little bit earlier. It dates to the first half of the um, of the ninth ninth century and perhaps even earlier. I wish I had that on me. I did. Oh, here we go. It says here, um, talking about the, the samples that were taken from the construction of this building, calculating the time of use of the two surfaces with an outlier model of OxCal, this is kind of the calibration model that they're using, constrains the construction date of building 100 to 900 to 850 BC. This is really early, really early. So remember, Solomon's ruling in Jerusalem up to 931, that's when he's, he, he dies. Um, and then you have another king, and then King Asa starts around, I think it's 915 or something like that, ballpark. And, and he rules for about 30-something years uh, through this threshold into the 9th century. And it's saying that, this study is saying that um, within, within, half century, within half century of Solomon's death, we already have expansion off the top of the ridge. So this is showing that, well, was this, was this built first? Was building 100 the first building in, in Jerusalem during the time, of the time of the biblical kings? It's in the valley. It's off the main ridge. And it's already dating to 900, the start of the build, this building. I'll read again. It says, the following dates reinforce the suggestion that the city expanded westward in the 9th century B.C., Possibly earlier. What do you mean possibly earlier than the 9th century BC? Possibly earlier than the 9th century BC is the 10th century BC. So perhaps they're saying even at the, even, um, at the very end of the 10th century, so really close to Solomon's time, that we have evidence now that it's already expanded off the eastern ridge, already expanded westward. So there's building outside most likely where the city walls are at this point. Or perhaps they're building a new city wall. So again, this is all showing us, even though it's not dating from David and Solomon's time, building 100, it's showing us that if something in the valley dates from 900, then the stuff on top of, of the hill must date earlier, and that'll put it during the 10th century. Again, showing that Jerusalem in the 10th century was a robust, uh, densely occupied city, um, something that the Bible describes. So absolutely fascinating point. I believe, um, with this. Uh, showing that the old house effect is real, that you can't just look at the preponderance of archaeological evidence in Jerusalem, which is always going to date to the, the period of, of last use. It's always going to be Jeremiah's time. You actually have to look at the foundations, look at the carbon samples, not necessarily most of the pottery, unless you have you know, a major renovation in the 10th century of the building. That's the only time that you're going to have 10th century pottery that's preserved. Um, or in the foundations of the buildings, everything below the floor. You're not going to find, you know, a destruction of Solomon's time in Jerusalem. So you're not going to find the wealth of that period represented in the archaeological re uh, record, but it will be represented in the construction materials of the building, uh, mortar and such, from the carbon samples. So, so good. Absolutely awesome. Um,
One other point I want to want to make uh, from this study, and this is the fact that um, on the eastern on the eastern side now. So if you go across the ridge from Givati towards the Gihon Spring, head a little bit further south, they found what is remarkable is a, a, a room that was um, that went through several restorations. Don't know why, but it did. They've got 11 consecutive floors that are built over the top of each other. And the earliest floor, they believe, based on the area that was adjacent to, was built just after the earthquake. Um, and this is an earthquake that's known from Amos chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, it's, I think it's the second year um, or two years after the earthquake. It's mentions there, uh, fried by the prophet Amos. And you can date Amos because he's related to King Jeroboam of the north, Jeroboam II. So this, he's saying sometime in the mid-7th century, 760, 750 in there is when this earthquake happened. And there's evidence for this earthquake everywhere throughout Israel, most lots of different sites. There's evidence in building 100 of the earthquake. There's evidence on this, on the other side of the, um, uh, on the other side of the city of David of the earthquake. And so they're using now, get this, they're using a, a earthquake to be their data point saying that this is true. We know that this earthquake happened here. And how are they dating that? They're not dating that on carbon dating. They're dating that from the Bible. Biblical dating is giving that date for the earthquake. This earthquake, this biblical event, is trusted so much that it is considered true. And then the carbon dates that are found in the layer related to that are going to be calibrated to that date. Now, you must, you, you, you'll know, and we discussed this a little bit in the article, so if this doesn't make sense, read the article, I think it will make sense, is that the dates that we receive from, you know, a carbon date, meaning that a carbon sample. So you've got a carbon sample uh, in a layer, and you send it off to be tested, and the amount of carbon-14 compared to carbon-12 that's in it will give you a date at which this organic thing died um, and before the present. But those dates that you get back are wrong. They're wrong. They, 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 give you, they give you a date, but then that date needs to be calibrated, right? It needs to be calibrated to be made true. So all the dates that you see that I'm talking about right now, they are calibrated dates. Okay, so how are they calibrated? Meaning that how are they made true? They are made true um, by, the, by, the, um, by being compared to an object of known date or a carbon sample of known date, which in most cases are tree rings. Tree rings, trees grow a ring uh, every year or every growing season, pretty much. Uh, and so you can have trees that have been growing for 2,500, 2,600, 2,700 years. And those tree rings then, you take a carbon sample of year 2,700 uh, years ago. The tree ring is considered true because it's been 2,700 growing cycles, and you can see that replicated in the tree rings. And then the carbon sample of that tree ring comes back and says 2,600. And you're saying, before the present, what's going on? The carbon sample's off. Okay, great. That's fine. Let's just say then, from now on, every carbon sample that comes back that says 2,600, it actually means 2,700. So it's calibrated by the tree ring. Now, most of, the, most of the calibration of the worldwide calibration for carbon dating is taken of tree rings in the UK, in the United States. So what happens if there's a local variation? What happens if, if there is a, is a difference in the carbon-14 to carbon-12 in a local area or a region of the Earth? Now, this is what this, this, data, this carbon sample has done. It's probably the most important part of it, um, is that it has given us the ability, or given them the ability, um, to calibrate the, the carbon dating curve for carbon-14 uh, more accurately based not necessarily on the tree ring anymore, but based on the fact that this carbon sample was found in association with the destruction of, of, uh, uh, during Uzziah's time or, or destruction um, during Amos's time, or the carbon sample was found during another biblical event. 11 floors later in this site, or 11 floors later in this site, they found the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, and they've got carbon samples from that date. And so they took carbon samples from there, and they took carbon samples from the layer just after the earthquake in 750. And so you've got, you know, 150 years or 180 years of carbon samples that have been taken on each one of these consecutive floors going up with the two bookend dates being 586 and 760. And they're able then 
to then further calibrate or further see how off the, the current calibration curve is for carbon dates uh, for this area. And so they found big variations or big offsets. That's why the study is called, if I can read it again, the name of the study is uh, Radiocarbon Chronology of Iron Age Jerusalem Reveals Calibration Offsets, meaning that the calibration curve can, is, is, can be uh, adapted a little bit better for this local region based on the, the, the carbon dates that have came out of these two layers. And this is really important because this period between 700 or 800, 700, 600, 500, 400 is known as the Hell's Hellstat, <coughs> excuse me, plateau. And it's a period where there's worldwide problems. Uh, something happened uh, in the atmosphere through this period to the ratio between carbon 14 and carbon 12. Something crazy happened. And it, it, it's produced this up and down kind of the amounts of carbon-14 to carbon-12. And it's been a great big problem to date things using radiocarbon dating through, through this window of time um, because the curve is so squiggly uh, because carbon-14 to carbon-12 back then is not like it is today. Something happened. Uh, we won't get into what happened. We don't know. Um, but it's interesting that something happened. But what, this, what they're showing us is that they've been able to calibrate inside the Halstatt Plateau uh, in this area to then help from now on other carbon samples that are taken. And what are they using to calibrate it? I find this absolutely fascinating. This is biblical archaeology at its finest, if you're asking me. They're using well-corroborated biblical events such as the Amos earthquake or the destruction of Jerusalem they know it's so true. They know that the biblical event is so accurate because you've got all these other evidences that have been brought in, whether it's Assyrian documents just saying the same thing, Babylonian documents saying the same thing, and the actual evidence of the earthquake itself in Jerusalem dated stratigraphically to that time period outside of carbon dating, or it's the destruction of the large-scale destruction of Jerusalem that the book of 2 Kings describes and, gives, and chronicles and gives an actual date to. That is just considered so accurate that we are going to calibrate the carbon, scientific carbon-14 dating curve to a biblical event. This is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So our article is entitled a, radio carbon, a, radio, sorry, a Revolutionary Carbon Dating Study of Ancient Jerusalem. It's coming out in the latest edition of Let the Stone Speak. Uh, it's already been to the printer. It hasn't been sent out yet, but it will be sent out soon. And um, if you haven't got this copy, you're going to have to just look at the PDF online. Uh, we can't send you this copy. It's already passed the, the cut for the, for the, mail, for the mailing. Um, however, if you want to get all of our uh, Let the Stone Speak magazines going forward, you can do that. Go to our website, armstronginstitute.org. And um, you'll find the magazine. Just scroll down a little bit, and there'll be a place to enter into your, into your details. This is something that's free. It's offered absolutely free. Always will be free. And you can sign up for six your next six copies or the next year. It comes out bi-monthly. It's full color, 40 pages. And um, then after the year is complete, we'll send you a reminder saying that your subscription is going to run out. Please renew if you so desire. And at that point, we will charge you nothing again and you can um, renew for another year. But if you, if you want to kind of capture the highlights of this study, um, please go ahead and uh, read A Revolutionary Carbon Dating Study of Ancient Jerusalem. Uh, in that article and also in the show notes of today's program, I'm going to have a link to the actual um, uh, study itself from the journal, so you can fact check me if you so desire. I'm also going to put a link there to a, um, a, a, another piece that was put out by Chandler Collins, um, archaeologist. He's, he writes, a, a, I think it's kind of a blog, it's called Approaching Jerusalem, and uh, this is Jerusalem in brief number five. He probably does the best uh, first take of the study, uh, I believe, and um, 
of some of the key findings of the study. Uh, one of his points is that it's interesting that they talk about a westward expansion of Jerusalem. He kind of favors this idea that perhaps there was all there is. It didn't necessarily have to expand from the ancient core out to the west, but perhaps they were two separate. There was the ancient core in the eastern side, but on the western hill there was already there was a, a habitation happening there, and they, perhaps they met in the middle or something like that. So his just definition of expansion, um, he doesn't like that. Um, but nevertheless, he does a really good job, and I wanted to give a shout out to him. Um, for his for his representation of the study itself. I'll also put a link to the Haaretz article, um, which is mostly great, I would say. Uh, I might just bring out one quote uh, from this, this because it, it interviews um, uh, Elisabetta Boreto, who was one of the chief uh, people that were studying in the scientists doing the carbon dating part of the study, and also Yuval Gadot, uh, who is the excavator of Building 100, co-director of the Gavati excavation, and um, he's, he's not necessarily, uh, Gadot isn't necessarily a biblical maximalist. Well, he's not. He's, he's on the minimal, more of the minimalist camp, um, or has been. But however, the evidence just coming out of his excavation, based on this study, he's just saying that, well, the evidence is pointing, um, the evidence is pointing definitely towards a 10th century Davidic and Solomonic uh, construction of Jerusalem, that period, if anything, it, it, this study pushes the argument towards the truth of that, rather than away from away from Jerusalem inhabited during the ninth century or the tenth century is just a p pity, you know, uh, a little a little ramshackle uh, tribal uh, tribal city. He says this: if the pendulum has to move somewhere, it now goes more in the direction of the city than the village, because of these results. So his pendulum is swinging based on these results towards 10th century Jerusalem being a city, um, not just a little village. So this is great. I love seeing I love seeing how archaeological evidence as presented to a scientist makes a scientist or an archaeologist then refine their understanding and follow where the evidence leads. And I think this study is a great example of that. Okay. That's it for today's program. Thanks very much for joining me. I'm Brent Noctigal here in Armstrong Auditorium where we have our exhibit, Kingdom of David and Solomon Discovered. Please come and see us, absolutely free. Uh, you can get in here. We'll give you a tour of, of, of the exhibit, of the different artifacts and the different evidences for 10th century Israel, the time of David and Solomon.